Hello everybody, it's Dante here. Today I want to talk about the Yogi Bhajan uh, thing, the allegations against him and all of this new information coming out within the Kundalini Yoga community about the abuse and the control and so much more. If you have not found out about it, I will put a couple of links that can fill you in in the video description and obviously I did not study under Yogi Bhajan uh, he was dead by the time I found out about Kundalini Yoga though I have been involved in the 3HO to some degree and I've taught Kundalini Yoga for a number of years so I just want to share my experience about this and what I think about the practice because there's this kind of thought form well we can separate the teacher from the practice. We can separate the teachings from the teacher. And um, you can kind of decipher from what I share through this video how I interpret that. Um, because it isn't something that is black and white. And both of those, pers the perspective that the teacher isn't separate or is separate from the teachings can be true in different cases. In this case, the practice of Kundalini Yoga is um, quite a powerful practice that if you do it as it is taught, will give you an experience, an awakening. So I came to Kundalini Yoga in 2011 and I, so I um, was really drawn to yoga after having additional experiences with um, initial experiences with plant medicines that really opened me up to some higher frequencies that I combined with meditation and some yoga to kind of really drop into myself into some deeper states and I wanted to access that state through meditation and yoga alone and Kundalini Yoga was the most powerful yoga I found out there and I was you know really in this spiritual seeking and the kind of esoteric aspects and the sacred aspects I couldn't find in other yoga classes which were to an extent kind of mainstream so kundalini yoga kind of touched me in a way and I found the first class that I took at a rainbow gathering when I first kind of left um, home for the first time on a short trip and um, that initial experience with kundalini yoga is so much different than what I came to find as I went through the practice. So after taking uh, some classes on my own in Philadelphia um, with mostly one teacher, um, I would do the practice myself and I combined it with vinyasa yoga for a while. Eventually I left the vinyasa and the hatha stuff behind to only practice kundalini yoga. So. Um, fast forward some years, I've been teaching a while, and I went to India to um, deepen my practice of yoga, my study of yoga. I ended up in a 3HO teacher training led by some German teachers in Amritsar. And these were teachers that were very um, on a mission, so to speak, to bring the yoga teachings back to the region of Punjab where they had originated, yet in the Sikh religion yoga is sort of looked at as even satanic. Um, so they encountered a lot of resistance, but it was a really beautiful cultural experience for me. And this was the point that I started to see through the 3HO illusion in a lot of ways. For one, they invited a teacher to the first training who was one of Yogi Bhajan's assistants and somebody who worked very closely with him. And she gave this whole talk on his life and it was like kind of like a very romanticized talk about how it changed her life and everything that came as a result of it. But then at the end there was this kind of like shadowy bit where people had asked her I heard this about Yogi Bhajan's marriage and Yogi Bhajan's relationships with other students and she was like oh there's many stories out there there's so much out there you can look it up online but I'm not one to say anything so in a way she planted the seeds for everyone to go and look and didn't add her own commentary on it which felt very funny to all of us um, 
and I was connecting with another very long-term teacher there who wasn't a part of who wasn't teaching but was participating in the training to kind of tap into the Kundalini Yoga in Amritsar which was a very special place to him as he had adopted the Sikh religion and he told me all sorts of stories that took shattered the illusion for me that 3HO was really happy healthy holy and showed me that actually they were all in chaos they were all fighting yogi bhajan was arranging all of their marriages and was helping them smuggle drugs um or <laughs> I, he didn't say that yogi bhajan was doing it the, what the articles are saying now is that he was involved he just said that oh yeah yogi bhajan was covering for students that were involved in this drug smuggling thing and this and that so I kind of saw through it and actually, you know, one thing I'll get into as well is that it's not just the teachings that teachers transmit to the next generation, it's the nasty behaviors that go unchecked. Because that same person was making some pretty weird sexual advances on people I knew in the training. And it was a lot to witness and I somehow stuck with the practice for a couple of years because the practice was doing a lot for me. However, at the time I saw this very deep regimentation within the teachers. Um, I saw teachers who could not touch their toes yet were yoga teachers and were teaching about the principles of yoga but couldn't actually do half the asanas. So it was very just this mind trip for me. Why am I here taking this class when the teacher can't do what he's encouraging us to do? Um, and I was kind of very resistant to a lot of the things that they were pushing on us. Like, you can't use any substances at all whatsoever. And once you, like, and I would say something in the middle of the class, and the teacher was like, you have to choose between these paths. You have to choose between the path of yoga or the path of shamanism. You can't combine these things. And, like, really, like, yelling and using the upper, his throne on the chair to, like, enforce this belief onto people. And it was a moment for me that it didn't take me much longer after to be like, yeah, I can choose whatever I want and I am making my own path. So in that sense, it was a roundabout way for me to find my self-empowerment and you know, find my choice. In that um, and other kundalini yogis go on a very different school of thought. There's people that are still part of this organization that say like, oh yeah, well, People believe that, but we can do whatever we want and have their ayahuasca ceremonies and this and that in the background. Um, so it's interesting. Um, now, there was also a lot of sort of weird beliefs around sexuality and gender, and it was like they had no concept of how to frame anything that they were teaching outside of a heterosexual relationship and they were claiming to be open and I was like oh it's okay you can be that and be a part of this um, and of course I met other kundalini yoga teachers later who um, were part of it for longer and spoke of the intense and ridiculous homophobia and that they were arranged in marriages and had children and basically spent most of their adult lives not exploring one of the most important parts of themselves their sexuality in their heart um, <laughs> so it's really bizarre to see how messed up the organization is and that's just a part of it so that's how I kind of saw that and and, you know, a couple years later, I changed, I stopped calling my classes Kundalini Yoga, and I called them Kundaluni Yoga, and um, went against the rules and served them cacao right before class, and combined it with laughter yoga to really make it lighthearted and go totally against the grain of the Kundalini Yoga regimentation. Um, but at a point when I first started this practice, that was how my spirituality emerged. And it was a total inauthentic moment of my life where I was like, oh, I, I want to be spiritual because, you know, reading all these ideas, immersing yourselves in so many different spiritual books and all of this, it's like, I have to be very serious and very focused and very 
committed to this and um, commitment is real but all of the regimentation and rigidity and control and do it this way at this time for this long always is actually kind of insanity and it goes against our natural rhythm and our ability to actually be in the moment and those points in my life were points where I felt so controlled really confused and unable to really show up to life and live um, I had a lot of judgments about everything even things that I would do I was judging because I was holding myself to these crazy standards that Kundalini Yoga put um, in my mind and that I tried to live by by being a good yoga teacher the most spiritual kind of yoga teacher insanity so I'm actually going to put a time stamp in because now I want to talk about how the yoga is not actually very helpful either um, so I came to yoga more for the spiritual side of things like I wasn't really aware of how messed up my body was <laughs> But I came to discover it quite quickly, and I was really focused on just clearing my energy body, having an open energy channel. I got involved in energy healing not long after I discovered yoga as well. And, you know, it was kind of, looking back, it was kind of like a trip for me of like, how high can this practice make me? Um, and doing breath of fire and these weird asanas and meditating with a mantra and moving your fingers or holding your arms in this weird, really uncomfortable way. I don't know, like the strangest stuff you do in Kundalini Yoga. Um, it gives you a high because you're creating all of these endorphins in your body and you're... Um, I, a lot of the stuff Yogi Bhajan taught did not directly come from where he said it came or he made it up but he did have some understanding of how that works out your energy body now is that a good thing just because you're getting this you're feeling this effect is that can you say it's good um, and my experience is actually no it, it makes you really spaced out um, and so I immerse myself in a lot of the the practices and also you know, listening to the recordings of Yogi Bhajan and reading it, you get this energy of like, do your work, do it, work out yoga, meditation this long every day. And so I was like, I had time on my hands. I quit my job because I was too spiritual to show up to work or I couldn't handle being in that energy in my mind. Like, I, I didn't have the tools to really be on this earth as a star seed at that point. Um, <laughs> And, and I was just doing, you know, waking up at four in the morning, taking the cold shower, doing two and a half, not more than that, like three hours of yoga, making myself do the same kriya every day with my arms up like this on my knees, sat nam, sat nam. And I was having out of body experiences in Shavasana, like I was having like terrible nightmares in Shavasana because I was pushing my body so far and then I would just go out and leave and um, just from this practice I wasn't at times that I was having these experiences I wasn't using substances I was just doing yoga and just trying to live that lifestyle and it kind of really rocked me um, and I got really really sick for a while when I was doing yoga for that long I like I couldn't go to the bathroom I was really constipated I went to an Ayurvedic um, doctor and they said that I was comp my vata which is not I'm a pitta kapha so vata is not something that usually should be in my body but it was on the extreme so vata if you're not familiar with Ayurveda is the ether and the air and it's because this practice sends you up into the ether and into the air um, it was so out of balance that I couldn't eliminate I was like couldn't sleep I was always like nervous and it felt really really bad <laughs> so actually it was cutting down the yoga that kind of brought me relief from that and then I learned from that experience that okay you can do yoga every day but you don't need to do it that long um, so I stopped forcing myself to do it and still practice kundalini yoga and taught kundalini yoga and the way that they kind of prescribe it is that oh well 
you just have to find the kriyas in the manual and you practice them and you teach them and you do it as it is unless you need to adjust for your body. And even later as I, I did the kundalini yoga training, um, they didn't really talk that much about posture or alignment within the poses. They taught us very clearly how to breathe um, and that was helpful, but they didn't teach us about aligning your body. They maybe taught us how to align our body in a squat because they make you do a lot of squats in kundalini yoga. But, you know, we learned more clearly how to do some of the postures, but it wasn't any in any way a process of how do you find comfort in your own body? How do you relieve the symptoms that your body is having? How do you heal your body and how do you recognize where your body is out of balance? So the way that this yoga is taught is not actually a therapy. It's just prescriptions that this kriya is for that, that kriya is for that. And quite probably some of these kriyas, I'm going to get some drumming in the video, quite probably some of these kriyas have been around for a while teachers that Yogi Bhajan studied with. And if you look in all the info, um, there's a lot of evidence to show that Yogi Bhajan did not, was not honest about where he learned some of this stuff from, right? Um, and so going even further into what, you know, what this really did to my body, um, I discovered not long after, um, a couple years, five years maybe, into the Kundalini Yoga practice, that I have a condition called tibial torsion, where you know most knees are straight, but some knees, oh, I can't even do it with my fingers, but they make like an X shape, right? Like the knees come in. And this was kind of shocked, like a surprise to me, but it made sense of why my body was having so many issues all the time. And um, after discovering that, I had to change everything about my practice and even not do kundalini yoga, I realized, you know, oh, the way that we're sitting in this same posture all the time is actually making my condition worse. The way all of these kriyas are very focused only on strengthening your abdominal muscles is actually counterproductive to my condition with my legs. And so, you know, I considered myself kind of in recovery from kundalini yoga um, for the past two or three years. Um, I did find some kriyas that are actually helpful to my condition, and I would really stick to practicing and teaching those. But once I kind of had this realization, it was like I shifted to teaching, to practicing hatha and vinyasa yoga, which was where I started with yoga in the first place. I did that training before I did the kundalini one. But it, it didn't seem spiritual enough to me. So that was a trap I was pulled into. Um, and yeah, I I did continue to teach Kundalini Yoga up until two years ago. I was teaching Kundalini Yoga, and it was really fun because this breathing, these practices, it expands your energy. It makes you feel very connected and very buzzing in a way that increases your life force. It gets this energy to rise in a beautiful, powerful way. Um, and I'm really lucky to have gone back to the roots and doing Hatha Yoga and Vinyasa Yoga and figuring out how I can heal this condition in my body because it is one that causes a lot of pain and these past this past month or so now I've really been going deep in a beautiful way and I've made a lot of progress. Um, we really need to take the time off um, in order to do that and I'm lucky to have been able to do that. What else? And I'm also very fortunate to have encountered another Kriya, another form of Kriya Yoga that also, it's actually even deeper for the expanding the lung capacity and bringing us into this meditative state. So I think Kundalini Yoga was a good exposure to me to the practice of expanding your lung capacity and breathing deeper and all of this, though on another level, it was a very challenging trip into a lot of control, feeling controlled by the teachers. Even at points when I first began the practice, it was like I felt I pushed um, myself too hard. I pushed my students too hard in the classes. All of this regimentation and rigidity really influenced my thinking, my feeling, 
my life. And I didn't even meet Yogi Bhajan or study deeply with a Kundalini yoga teacher at this point. So what I see this as is kind of like a reflection of the forces of patriarchy and the control that we're subject to. We, you know, there's a whole section of the spiritual world that's all about controlling yourself, controlling this, controlling that. And everything Yogi Bhajan taught to control in terms of your sexuality and um, not being greedy, he violated directly. Um, and it just goes to show you that within the spiritual world, whether it's religion or even New Age spirituality, when you see somebody preaching and you see somebody pushing agendas, most often of the time that person isn't living their word. So whenever there's this aggression, this pushiness, I'm cautious about that now. Whenever somebody is also, there's also a lot to say about the control, regimentation, patriarchal energies, when somebody is comparing the group or comparing us, even if it's saying, oh, us light workers, us star seeds, us this, us that, us this label, we are different from them out there. We are different. Even recently I had people who are really like, like really deep into this idea of spiritual bypassing or this idea of colonization or this idea of, of whatever have you. It was like, we are different because we're not doing that and we have to come together and talk about and compare ourselves to those out there. And there's a lot of that in Kundalini Yoga too, where you hear Yogi Bhajan talking about how awful everyone in modern life is, and they're all fueled by the ego, and they're all doing this, or all doing that. And that's exactly what Yogi Bhajan himself was doing. Um, and at this time, I think this is all coming out now, because we really are coming to the end of patriarchy. And and it's really interesting now with, you know, we're about to move into one degree Aquarius. We'll go retrograde, um, or move into Aquarius, and then at one degree Aquarius it goes retrograde. And then it comes back into Aquarius with Jupiter meeting in one degree Aquarius um, after the solstice sometime in December this year. And that, to me and to some astrologers, signifies the beginning of the Aquarian Age. Yogi Bhajan was all about the Aquarian Age. This is Aquarian Yoga. We are Aquarians. Aquarian means egalitarian, community-based, looking at the needs of all, challenging the status quo, expanding, renovating, innovating, and looking towards the new. Um, and it's very ironic that everything about Kundalini Yoga was the opposite of that. It was all about, and has been about since the death, following and listening to the word of one leader who knows better than you. Everyone homogenizing and following the same rules and lifestyle. Um, keeping the masculine in power over the feminine. And keeping alive a tradition rather than allowing things to evolve and become something new. There are a lot of patriarchal dark leaders. Um, most of them are men. There are some women who operate under the same control regimentation and take their power from people. So don't join the cult. <laughs> That's, um, and what do I think about the practice of Kundalini Yoga? I think that we should strip it away. We should take and make our own Kriyas because essentially that's what Yogi Bhajan was doing. We need to learn what it's really like to balance the body with the asanas in a sequential way, follow the krama theory that's different than karma, look up krama theory if you're not a yoga teacher, and learn how to deliver something to people that actually balances them. And you can, yeah, you use the breath of fire, you use long breath retention, you use all the locks, you use the back and forth and the powerful rapid breathing. That's a really powerful part of yoga practice that is more advanced, that is more awakening, that Yogi Bhajan included. And it's something that opens people up and makes them suggestible. So when you're so high and floating and somebody tells you that this is the key to salvation, they're going to believe it. And we have to be really, really cautious when we really go into more advanced states of yoga and, uh, you know, play play with those high energies and high frequencies, people become suggestible. What are we using that for? Is our ego in the background influencing us to get to some other agenda? Um, a lot of people aren't conscious about everything that they're saying with their energy, that they're not saying with words, but they're 
communicating energetically somehow. And there's still a lot of weird, abusive things happening in the spiritual community that aren't always from the big authority figure. But it's a weird world. That's all I gotta say. Um, there's a lot of noise in the background. I'm trying to just stay in the flow state. I hope you're enjoying the noise and it gives you a little taste of the wildness here. Maybe wild isn't the right word. Whatever they're doing. Um, <laughs> so, what was the last thing I wanted to say? It's something, I think, if you find yourself down Kundalini Yoga or any other sort of cult, you're learning through the back door a way to your self-empowerment by giving yourself over to somebody who believes they know better than you. And it's something that we're taught from a very young age, that we can't find the answers within, that we need to look outside, that external authority that we don't have an internal authority and for a lot of us we have to learn by being abused by those external authorities what it means to have internal authority and so kundalini yoga is one path that i followed i worked with some other teachers who were also controlling and i'm really at this point snapping out of it as i believe will happen for a lot of people with this aquarian thing I've been snapping out of it out of it for a while but now i'm really seeing it clear way of that's what it is like retrospect why did I have to go through this um, and I hope other people can do that as well and they can find their power within and a last bit of like I haven't changed my name on Facebook yet I'm Dante Shante Singh why is my name Dante Shante Singh I got the Singh from the Kundalini Yoga Shante was the name of my cat when I was like seven years old um, my cat was named Shante for about a week until I was a little older than that, maybe nine. Anyway, that was the name of my cat for a while until every time my mom said it, I would respond because Dante and Shante remind, they sound very similar, right? So we had to change the name of the cat because my mom didn't want to always like have me respond when she said Shante. But something about that name, it came through one time and I was like, yeah, that. And then I learned all these other things like, oh, that's what they say in Drag Race. Oh, Shante, you say, like, that's, that's cool, like, fine, like... I don't really do drag that much. I wear dresses. It's not the same. It's kind of drag. But, um, and Shantae has, it's like Shanti. I, that's what I thought as well at first. I was like, oh, Dante, Shanti, but a little different. Anyway, I'm talking too much about that. That's a side story. <laughs> it means a lot of things in some other spiritual traditions as well. Shantae, I discovered it later because people were like, oh, you, you named yourself this because of that. And what I decided is like, Shantae is just there and you can decide what it means. Um, and sing is, um, it means lion of God, and lion is one of my power animals. A lot of people say I look like a lion, um, and it has a lot to do with this energy of courage and fearlessly moving forward and standing in your power inside, and I really like being a lion. And um, cultural appropriation is a big topic these days, and I find it kind of edgy, so appropriating that name as my own feels kind of like, you know, we're challenging things a little bit. We're really examining what these ideas really mean, right? Um, I don't know. Basically, I, I'm not changing my name because if I made up a new name, they might do that weird name search thing on me. And Singh is an adopted name, so I can just keep using that for now. And that'll be my Facebook name. But I'm really in no way associated with 3HO and Kundalini Yoga at this point. Um, some people asked me to teach some classes a while back, and there are still a few Kriyas that I enjoy. But out of the thousand Kriyas, I practice maybe a couple hundred, and most of them were really just annoying. And I experience a deeper healing in my body through doing my own yoga and listening to my body, doing Hatha yoga and finding the sore places, going into them looking at my muscles, working with massage therapists and body workers, chiropractors, you name it, and, you know, seeing where there's these blockages and really bringing all my energy into them because yoga is supposed to bring you into your body and it's supposed to balance you so that you can have a proper seat for meditation. Eight pillars of yoga. Third is asana. And 
Yogi, Yogi Bhajan skipped all of them because he didn't even teach good asanas. It went, he went right to the pranayama and into the samadhi, spaced people out to control them, did not practice his nam, namas ni, niyamas, restraints and observances. Um, and these are some of the most important things. If you are on a spiritual path at all, look at the yamas and the niyamas first as a guide, even if it's not a yoga path. There's a lot to see from there, and there's a lot that you can, you know, use as sort of a moral compass of if you're going to expand spiritually, you got to start with your foundation. And if you're going to meditate and be a spiritual pioneer or astronaut, you've got to get it worked out in your body first. You can't be a yoga teacher as fat as Yogi Bhajan and really expect it to be something that passes as a suitable form of body work. Um, I don't know, you know, this should have been the first thing I said, but look at how fat that man was. How is he a yoga master? And for that matter, how are some of the leading teachers in 3HO a yoga, ma yoga masters? They can't touch their toes. They, all they do is regurgitate the information from this dead guy who is a rapist. And, <laughs> um... You know, there's a lot of 3HO yogis I see that can't do yoga. They're fat like Yogi Bhajan and they are just on their religious trip. It's really old, it's for a different time, and I think I've really put it all into perspective now. By the way, that um, just for another detail that some people may not have gotten, but one of those, that guy that I met in India, longtime 3HO person, said that Yogi Bhajan had a secret cannabis cookbook. So meanwhile, he's telling people they can't use any substances, and he is, according to this teacher, high on nutmeg every single day of his life on nutmeg and I tried nutmeg in India I crushed them up with bananas and it feels a lot like marijuana um, it did give me a sort of spiritual experience in Amritsar being high on nutmeg um, and you know I didn't mention that and it's good to have some gratitude as well I am grateful that this brought me to India and to have this cultural experience that really changed my life and maybe I'll talk about that in a different video because it is a different thing but I really was blown away by India it was the hardest experience